For nearly a decade, I owned and operated a restaurant called Eleven Madison Park. To give you some context, if you don't know what that is, Eleven Madison is a very fancy restaurant on the corner of 24th and Madison here in New York City. I mean, like very fancy. We're talking servers wearing suits and ties, like crisp, ironed white tablecloths. More than 30 cooks in the kitchen, serving like 10, 15 course tasting menus. I think you get the gist. When I got there in 2006, it was kind of a middling brasserie, but by the time I sold it at the beginning of 2020, it had been named the number one restaurant in the world. Thank you. Now, to be clear, our, our kitchen served. Unbelievably delicious and incredibly innovative food. Our service was so gracious and as close to technically perfect as possible. And our dining room—I mean, just Google a picture. It's one of the most beautiful out there. And it was because of those reasons that we were consistently on the list of the 50 best restaurants in the world. But it was a hot dog that earned us the number one spot on that list, or rather, the winning strategy that it gave birth to. Unreasonable hospitality, the principle that guided us as we took ordinary transactions and turned them into extraordinary experiences. In early 2010, on a busier than normal lunch service, I was in the dining room helping out the servers when I found myself clearing appetizers from a table of four foodies on vacation to New York, and they were going to the airport to head back home after their meal. I overheard them talking. What an amazing trip! We've been to all the best restaurants, and they listed a bunch:、uh, Per Se, Le Bernardin, Danielle, Momofuku. Now, Eleven Madison Park. Then another person jumped in. Yeah, but the only thing we didn't get to try was a New York City hot dog. You know those moments in a cartoon where the animated light bulb goes off <laughs> over the character's head, signifying they're about to come up with a really good idea? If you'd been in the room with me that day, you would have seen one appear over mine. As calmly as I possibly could, I walked gracefully back into the kitchen, dropped off the plates, and then literally ran out the front door and down the block to the hot dog cart. I bought a hot dog and ran just as fast back into the kitchen. Now came the hard part: convincing the chef to serve it <laughs> in our fancy fine dining restaurant. Guys, he looked at me like I'd lost my mind. <laughs> Serving what New Yorkers call a dirty water dog in a fancy four-star restaurant, but I asked him to trust me. And I told him it was important to me. And eventually, he agreed to cut the hot dog up into four perfect pieces, adding a little swish of ketchup and a swish of mustard onto each <laughs> plate, and finishing them with a canel of sauerkraut and a canel of relish. Then, before we served at the table, their final savory course, which happened to be a honey lavender glazed Muscovy duck that had been dry aged for two weeks, utilizing a technique that had taken years to perfect, we brought them their hot dog. <laughs> I introduced it to make sure you don't go home with any culinary regrets. A New York City hot dog, guys. They freaked out. <laughs> I'm not kidding. At that point in my career, I had served thousands of dishes and many, many, many thousands of dollars worth of food, and I can confidently say that no one had ever reacted to anything I served them better than they reacted to that hot dog. Each person said it was not only the highlight of their meal, but of their entire trip to New York, and they'd be telling the story for the rest of their lives. See, that hot dog changed the way I approach restaurants from that point forward, because up until then I had been so focused on excellence, on all the little details that go into making a meal great, that I somehow hadn't realized something really important: that in restaurants, our reason for being. Is to make people feel seen. It's to make them feel welcome. It's to give them a sense of belonging. See, in restaurants, the food, the service, the design—they're simply ingredients in the recipe of human connection. That is hospitality. And I realized if we could be unreasonable in our pursuit of that, we could give people the kind of experiences they would remember forever. It was only then that I realized I wasn't actually in the business of serving people dinner. I was in the business of serving them memories. I obsessed over that hot dog. I kept on going back to the experience and trying to figure out what happened that you know the whole thing went down. Like what happens so that it could happen, and what needed to happen so that it could start happening all the time. First, being present. 
which I get, it's like kind of overused these days. But for me, being present means caring so much about the thing you're doing or the person you're with that you stop caring about all the other things you need to do. And it's essential in delivering unreasonable hospitality. See, so often we have such long to-do lists that we aren't able to slow down enough to actually listen to the people around us, to the things they're saying and all the things they're not saying. If I hadn't been present at that table, I never would have heard that throwaway line about the hot dog. Second, it required taking what you do seriously without taking yourself too seriously. Way too often in customer service businesses, we let these self-imposed standards get in the way of us giving our customers the thing they actually want. Okay, a hot dog in a four-star restaurant is sacrilegious. but look at the way it made them feel. And third, it required the acknowledgement that if what you're trying to do is give people a sense of genuine belonging, one size fits one. Hospitality is about making people feel seen. And the best way to do that is not to treat them like a commodity, but as a unique individual. I really do believe I could have comped that table a bottle of vintage champagne and given them a free bucket of caviar, and it would not have had the same impact as that $2 hot dog, because it would not have been specific to them. The hot dog had given us a new true north, and now we had a roadmap. I started talking about it constantly at staff meetings, telling the team like, what led to the gesture and encouraging them to go out into the dining room to find opportunities of their own. And they were just as fired up as I was. And we got started right away, every night finding a few really cool experiences to deliver to our guests. We had unlocked something important. We knew it was working. But we wanted more of it. We wanted to give these kinds of things to almost everyone. We wanted to make it a bigger part of our, cult- our culture. And we recognized that we needed to invest in the resources to make that possible. So we added a position to the team. someone whose only responsibility was to help everyone else bring their ideas to life. We called the position the Dreamweaver, named after the iconic song by Gary Wright. You've heard it, even if you don't think you have. I'll help you. It goes something like, Whoa, Dreamweaver! <laughs> oh, sorry. I... <laughs> I, I just had to sing it because that song is actually pretty important to me. It was playing the first time I kissed a girl. It will now be stuck in your head for the rest of the day. You're welcome. <laughs> And with the addition of that position, we were on fire. Sincerely. A, a guest warned us in advance that his dad was more of a Budweiser, steak and potatoes kind of guy than Sauterne and foie gras. So the Dreamweavers turned our fancy champagne cart into a Budweiser cart. filled with every available type of Budweiser at every bodega in the neighborhood. <laughs> a couple came in to console themselves after their beach vacation flight was canceled. So at the end of their meal, we turned our private dining room into their very own private beach, with reclining folding chairs, a ton of sand on the ground, and a kiddie pool filled with water they could dip their feet into while they drowned their sorrows over tropical Mai Tais with those little umbrellas. Or a family of four from Spain was in the restaurant. They were in New York on vacation. And while they were eating, the most beautiful thing happened. The kids were looking out our massive windows with wonder. It had started snowing, and it was the first time they'd ever seen real snow. The Dreamweaver somehow found a store that was still open at 8 o'clock on a Friday night. When they left the restaurant, there was a chauffeur-driven SUV waiting to take them to Central Park for the most special nightcap, a few hours of play in the freshly fallen snow. With these gestures and so many more, our guests were obviously happier than ever. But you know what? This is the cool part. So is our team. Because for the first time, they had creative autonomy. They were no longer just helping to execute someone else's vision, serving plates of food someone else had created. They were coming up with their own ideas, and those ideas were affecting the guest experience. They were empowered. But mostly, I mean, we were all just happy because we were making other people really, really happy. There are few things more energizing than seeing the look of complete joy on someone's face when they receive a gift that you are responsible for giving. It can become one of the most beautiful addictions. And as we all found ourselves quickly becoming addicted to going above and beyond for our guests, we found ourselves going above and beyond for one another as well. 
Now, I'm just going to say this because I'm sure some people are thinking it. Unreasonable hospitality is not just for fancy restaurants. I get it. Some of the gestures I just described were quite extravagant. We did hire people onto the team to help us execute them more consistently. But remember, that hot dog only cost two dollars, and the impact it had was priceless. It does not take a big budget to start infusing this into your culture, because remember, it's not the cost of the gesture that matters; it's how it makes people feel. For most of America's history, we were a manufacturing economy. Now we're a service economy, and dramatically so. More than three quarters of our GDP is driven by service industries. Globally, it's more than 65 percent. That means that whether you're in real estate or retail or construction or finance or insurance or computer services, you do the same thing for a living that I do. You're in the business of serving other people. And if you start to look closely enough, you will find opportunities for unreasonable hospitality to give people more than they could ever possibly expect all around you. Take real estate agents, for example. Every time I've bought or rented a new apartment, at best, the agent has left me a bottle of sparkling wine in the fridge as my thank you slash congratulations gift. At worst, they've just thrown the keys on the kitchen counter. <laughs> Now, this is someone with whom I've spent weeks, if not months, looking together for my new home. If they've been paying attention, they should know every intimate detail of my life. So imagine instead, if the first time my wife and I walked into the apartment that we ended up choosing, they overheard her talking about the nook she imagined herself doing yoga every morning. And when we moved in, instead of that obligatory bottle of bubbles, in that nook was a brand new yoga mat with a candle and a note that said "Welcome to your new home." I think that would be pretty cool. And compared to the average commission, it's a pretty insignificant investment in what will inevitably become a lifelong relationship. This is not rocket science. It just requires caring a little bit more, and trying a little bit harder. Being present, not taking yourself too seriously, and remembering that one size fits one. Just go with me here. Imagine if the person that checked you into the dentist's office started thinking like this. Imagine if the person that sold you your next car started thinking like this. Or better yet, imagine if everyone on your entire team started thinking like this. Because making good products, it's no longer enough. Serving them efficiently is no longer enough. It's how we make people feel that matters most of all. Because I believe we are on the precipice of becoming a hospitality economy. Listen, unreasonable hospitality helped my restaurant accomplish every single one of our goals, and it turned the people I worked with from a collection of individuals into a trusting team. Unlocking a collective creativity and capacity we had never experienced before. So the next time you find yourself pursuing a relationship with someone you work with or someone you serve, I'm just here to encourage you to try being a little bit more unreasonable. <laughs> Give people that sense of belonging. Give them a memory that can last a lifetime. It will transform your business, but I can also promise you this. It will make you and all the people around you feel really, really, really good. Thank you. I've made so many mistakes as a leader, and I've found that if I'm willing to step up in front of my team during pre-meal and publicly acknowledge that I made a mistake and apologize for it, you know, when a leader is dropping the ball. The negative impact it can have on morale. It's unbelievable. In one moment, if someone stands up and say, "Guys, I fucked up, and I'm sorry, and this is what I'm doing to fix it," if morale is like a balloon that's about to pop, you say that suddenly it deflates. And by the way, people are going to be so much more willing to receive criticism from you if you're just as willing to criticize yourself. And so, if I can be vulnerable about my mistakes, then perhaps that will encourage them to be vulnerable. With each other, I think it's like parenting. We're all parenting each other.、Um, and how do you raise a good kid? I think you just try to be the best version of yourself in hopes that they'll follow suit. Story. Yeah, I was running cafes at the Museum of Modern Art for Danny Meyer,、um, and I was actually with some of the students、uh, here yesterday. I, I told the story.、Uh, 
I wanted, I didn't want to be in fine dining anymore. I had had a really bad incident where I was a busboy at Spago and I got like ripped into so hard by the chef for a mistake that I didn't make. And I had PTSD for years and I was over it. I didn't want to be in fine dining anymore. And so I went to work for Danny Meyer and I said, Hey, I want to be a GM with you, but I don't want to be in one of your fine dining restaurants. And he was just opening MoMA. And so I did the cafe on the second floor, the fifth floor, the staff cafeteria, the concessions. Um, and my goal was to work at Shake Shack. I really, really wanted to be at Shake Shack. This was when there was just one. I wanted to run it. And he came to me and said, hey, I'd love for you to go to 11 Madison Park. I was like, dude, <laughs> what about our conversations have you not heard? Um, but my dad, uh, who's given me a lot of wisdom my entire life, said, hey, if they need you for something, you should be there for them. And then when you need them for something, they'll be there for you. And so I agreed to go to 11 Madison Park for one year. Um, I'll get back to it. A year later, they came back and said, are you ready to go to Shake Shack? And I said, no. I don't know if you heard about the IPO at Shake Shack. <laughs> but I have no regrets. Uh, <clears throat> so I walked into the dining room. And by the way, everyone at 11 Madison Park that had been hired before I got there, they were like ballers, service directors, and wine directors, and captains from a lot of four-star restaurants and uh, Trotter and Gary Danko and then I was everyone's boss um, and so I walked into the dining room on my first night and there was a regular that I had known from my days managing Tabla and I walked over to the table and just leaned on the table to talk to him um, if you've ever worked in a four star restaurant that's like a really bad thing to do <laughs> And I walked into the service station, and the service director came up to me, and in an emotional mix of anger, frustration, nervousness, and respect, said, you know you're not allowed to touch the table. Um, and I think one of the, we talk about superpowers a lot, like if you don't have the capacity to name with humility the thing that makes you great at what you do, you won't be able to fully lean into that thing and make sure that you're taking full advantage of it. My superpower in the beginning was my inexperience. Um, a week later, it became a rule that captains had to touch the tables. And here's the thing, we are there to connect with people. I don't want to be served by someone who is all snooty. Like, if you literally break uh, the distance, like, why is that theirs and this is ours? Why can't we share the same real estate? I'm leaning in to try to invest in developing a relationship with you. If there is a rule that makes no sense and it makes it harder for us to do the one thing that we are there to do, then it should go away. And just because I was pissed off at the service director, I made a rule in the other direction, so. <laughs> I mean, once you actually articulate what you're trying to accomplish and everyone knows the, the shared vision then you get a ton of great ideas. We've always, I believe in restaurants that people are going to be that much more inclined to help you get somewhere if they're a part of deciding where you're going. I also believe that the collective brain power of 150 people will always far surpass that one or two. And so if you can create environments where everyone is not only given an opportunity, but actually a responsibility to come up with ideas to make your restaurant better. And you have the capacity to listen every single time someone comes to you with one of those ideas. It's pretty incredible what you can get. Um, we, uh, at the end of the meal for years, put a full bottle of liquor on the table, eau de vie or Applejack, and we pour a little bit and we say, hey, this is why the compliments, thank you so much. Help yourself to as much as you want. Um, and I don't remember whose idea that was. It wasn't mine. Um, but it was an amazing way to end the meal. Because there's no way for people, like, that feeling at the end of a long night where you're pouring someone, like, I love the idea of guests pouring each other drinks. That was a move towards casualness at the expense of formality, but not just because we didn't care about formality, because it was in pursuit of that connection. That was someone else's idea. Um, Canless uh, restaurant had ticketless coat check. And Brian can I, do you guys know what Canless restaurant is? I think it's one of the great restaurants in America. Brian was one of, yeah, give a pause. All right, it's like a mediocre restaurant. Uh, Brian was my roommate in college and he and I are extraordinarily competitive. And so he had ticketless coat check. 
and clairvoyant valet parking. And oh no no no, you're right. Yeah. He had clear. He had ticketless valet parking. So I wanted ticketless coat check, and then he did ticketless coat check, and so I was like, "I don't want a computer at the podium. We're gonna memorize everyone's reservations," and it was just to spite Brian in the beginning. But the the idea of it really was, you talk about connection. You talk about like actually making people feel seen, giving people a sense of belonging. That is what we're trying to do. Whether you're at a burger place or a three Michelin star restaurant, if you can make everyone that walks through the doors feel like they belong, I mean, that's the greatest gesture of hospitality I can think of. And so many restaurants, you walk in, they're like, good evening, what's the reservation? And then they look down and they poke a thing and then they say to the person, take him to 32. <laughs> it sucks. And so we just got rid of the podium and we had this system where the podium was over there and someone was looking at the computer and we had sign language so that they could communicate what to do. And by the way, it's not, a, none of it is hard. That's not actually that hard. You put a podium over there, you have two maitre d's, you come up with a little sign language, one person communicates to the other, you have some pictures of the people come in, you memorize some names. I know it sounds hard. It's actually not that hard. But you just decide that it's important and you pursue it with intention. I mean, it's interesting in that last panel, by the way, Jeff, I agree with Andrew. You did a really good job. Oh, thanks. You're connected. Affirming is a great way to connect. Um, <laughs> you guys talked about criticism, which I think is really good. And how do you receive criticism? I think criticism, we often talk about it in the restaurant business as coming from food critics. Uh, but it's just as important, perhaps even more powerful, when it comes from the people who work for you. Um, and how do you respond? Are you so focused on being right that you don't allow yourself to change? I've made a lot of mistakes. We've done stuff and we've gotten it wrong. With with let's we'll talk about the former like criticism from the from the world when we come up with a great idea. You know, there's people that like uh, to give gifts and those that like to receive. We try to hire the people that like to give. The gifts we get, if you're a gift giver, are the looks on people's faces when they receive them. Um for years, any time we introduced another really cool course, some experiential communal something, smoke or this or that, the first table that received it, what they didn't realize is I was in the corner of the room, like looking at them so creepy to wait for their expression. And there were definitely times where I was so excited to see them blown away and it was clear they weren't. Um, and sometimes you have to tweak an idea. Sometimes you just need to throw it away altogether. There's been things we've spent so much money and so much time on that lasted three days because they just didn't work. I'd rather be wrong and have people be happy than be so focused on being right that people leave unhappy. I think that's important. Um, with criticism, it's important to read as much as you can, as many of the reviews as you can. The moment you stop caring what people have to say about you, you risk becoming irrelevant. It's also important not to change every time someone doesn't like what you do, because you also need to have a point of view. You can't be all things to all people. When it comes to our team, yeah, I think in the same way you want them to really care about what you have to say, they never are going to really do that unless you really care about what they have to say. Um, I think as a leader, you need to push people beyond what they think they're capable of achieving. As a leader, you need to set impossibly high goals that people don't think they have the capacity to reach and watch them surprise even themselves. But sometimes you set the goals a little too high. Um, there was a course, I, I became obsessed with um, opening presents. I just think it's one of the greatest things in the world. Who doesn't like unwrapping a present? And so um, I went into work one day. I was like, you know how we're going to start the meal? Every table is going to be covered in presents. And you're going to walk in, and you're going to like rip open wrapping paper and throw the wrapping paper on the ground. And the first thing you're going to do is open a bunch of presents. Um, and it put us so far in the shits. Like, the morale, it was a disaster. Uh, we still did the idea. And people, they really, they don't want to let you down. But then eventually, someone who you really trust, every, if you're a manager of a restaurant, make sure you have, if you don't already have, the one or two people that you're close enough with where they'll pull you aside and they'll be like, 
dude, you got this one wrong. And so someone comes up and they told you, and, and we still did the presents, but we figured out a different way to do it and like allowed them to tell me why my idea wasn't working and then working together to make it work. I mean, if you don't do this, obviously you should. Like he was saying, what about, like what are the simple things? And obviously you gotta take a ton of notes about every single person that comes in and put them into the system so that we can use technology to help us have a better memory. One of the best ways to connect with someone is to remember things about them. We serve a ton of people every day. We, no one has a memory that's that good. And now we have technology. I think technology in many ways flies in the face of human connection unless you can put it in its proper place such that it actually aids in our ability to do that as opposed to getting in the way of it. I'll give you an example. Cell phones. Um, at the welcome conference a few years ago, we had uh, a theme, being present. Um, and we decided that we would put these black sealable bags under the seats. At the beginning, we said, this is not instructive. This is an invitation. This conference is about being present. If you want to join us, I'm putting your cell phone in the bag right now. And you get through the entire day without checking your phone. We'll give you a gift. And we had those like copper pineapples. Yeah, pilot presents. You know, didn't get a copper pineapple. Well, okay, I'm getting there. So, uh, there were like there were a thousand people at the conference. We expected maybe 150 people to do it. Like 500 people did it. We're like, we definitely don't have enough pineapples. <laughs> By the way, Sarah Rosenberg is here, and she was working with us at, at the time, uh, doing all the PR and stuff. And she's like, wait a minute, no one's going to be able to post about the conference. Uh, <laughs> and she was right, and it was awesome. Uh, so then a few years later, we're like, hey, we should do this at the restaurant. Let's put a box on the table. Same idea. We'll tell everyone to put their phones in the box if they want. We won't make it something that we shame people for. We had to really nuance the language. We're going to take the box away without even looking inside. If your phones are in there, great. We'll bring it back to you at the end. That really set Sarah off. Uh, until, what, live with... Kelly and whoever, Ryan or something, they did a whole thing about it. And then she said, I'm sorry, you were right. I was wrong. <laughs> she, she's saying I didn't say that. Would you like to speak about this? <laughs> uh, cell phones are not good for human connection over a meal. You see so many people, everyone in this room, my, I'm so guilty of this. You're like with the person you care about and you spend half of your meal on a cell phone. Giving people the invitation or the opportunity to get rid of it, it's a beautiful thing. Conversely, using technology to, enhance, technology to enhance our ability to care for people. We have so many notes about anyone that's ever come into our restaurant in the system. Because um, if you have walked into our restaurant three times in a row and you always get sparkling water and on the fourth time we don't automatically pour you sparkling water, we're not good at what we do. Um, if you every single time start out with a Plymouth Martini up with a twist, and I don't greet you with that the next time you come in, we're not good at what we do. Because it just takes a little bit of extra time and zero creativity, zero intelligence. It just takes making the decision to try a little bit harder. Avis had this commercial a long time ago, Try Harder. And I don't know that Avis is any better than the other rental car companies. But I was inspired by that because at the end of the day, I believe that that is a big part of what hospitality is. It's just making the decision that you're going to try harder than the other people. I think that's a pretty cool thing.